You've been hearing how some big brands are winning through simplicity. But don't get intimidated. You can do this too, no matter the size of your team or your budget. Want to learn the six behaviors you can instill to create simple experiences for your customers and your team members? Download a free copy of my simple playbook today. It'll help you immediately turn your customer experience around and create an Amazon experience without having an Amazon budget. Grab your copy of my simple playbook at mattliles.com slash simple playbook. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. When you think about most every business, no matter their size today, most every business started small. And they usually started with one person, two or three if they were lucky. And that business owner had to wear a number of hats. They had to figure out how to work on the business at the same time that they were working in the business. And the ones that are successful tend to grow, sometimes pretty quickly. And that business owner has to learn a lot of lessons as that business grows. Lessons around providing the customer experience, lessons around leading their people, lessons around when and how to make impactful decisions. And that's why I'm excited to be talking with Gigi Butler on the show this week. Gigi is the founder of the largest cupcake franchise in the world, Gigi's Cupcakes. And she's the author of The Secret Ingredient, Recipes for Success in Business and Life. Today, Gigi's a highly sought-after speaker where she gives her inspirational and entrepreneurial lessons. Gigi and I discuss her lessons from growing her business, as well as creating a consistent customer experience. And this was a really fun interview for me because I got to talk with Gigi live in her new restaurant and bakery, Gigi's Kitchen and Bakery. So if you hear any background noises, that's just Gigi's loyal customers coming in to get more of the food they love. Or that's me chomping down on some cherry crisp pie. Here it is, my interview with Gigi Butler. Hi, Gigi. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> Welcome. This is, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, this is, my, this is my second podcast interview live in person. Great. I interviewed in the middle of a taekwondo studio oh, awesome. a couple of weeks ago, but now this is fun, being able to interview right here, right at Pies by Gigi. Right, yes. And usually when I'm recording my <coughs> podcast interviews... I'll usually have like some kind of warm beverage, tea or water, you know, to drink while I'm doing that. This is the first time that I'm actually eating while I'm doing a podcast interview. I am eating the delicious cherry crisp pie by Pies by Gigi. Yes, it's delicious. It's, it's one of our best sellers. I can People tell. I love it, yes. Well, I love it too. So let's jump right in. You've had a pretty winding career and a really cool story, but can you walk me through your story? Okay. And how did you arrive to where you started Gigi's Cupcakes? Okay. Well, a quick version of that is I was raised with a very entrepreneurial family. Family. My dad was an amazing entrepreneur, and we had a potbelly pig business and, and a hair salon, and he was a fireman, and, and arcades and restaurants, and he didn't succeed at everything. But what it taught me at a very early age is just to go for it and feel the fear and do it anyways. So I was just taught, oh, I might as well start a business. So at seven years old, I knew I wanted to be a singer-songwriter and moved to Nashville. But before I did that, I needed to make money. So at 15, I started a cleaning company called Gigi's Cleaning Company and start bought some mops and buckets. And I'd seen my dad start businesses. So I'm like, well, might as well just start a cleaning company, knocked on doors. And that was the birth of Gigi's Cleaning Company. And then I started doing commercial construction with the cleaning company. And then singing at night, and I would clean during the day, sing at night, and started a band at 17, and then went on the road with the band, and then moved here right out of high school, and started cleaning here, and then singing at night here in Nashville, 
And I've been here a long time. Music was my love, and it was the thing that I thought I'd always be doing. But sometimes our path takes a different turn, and you have to be able to see it, acknowledge it, and switch paths. And that's very hard for most people to pivot. Oh, yeah. Bend that, and that really is hard for pe- people to pivot. Um, it really is. Because it, it, it can be kind of scary, you oh, know? It's very Think, scary. You know, like where you've gotten comfortable in what you've been doing. And right. then here's this new opportunity where you may see um, an opportunity to go, or sometimes it's really a need to go too. Or maybe not an opportunity, but just a closed door that shuts in your face. Yeah. And you're like, uh, what do I do now? Right. So that's where I was at. What do I, what do I do now? And how it happened was I was cleaning for a family. I don't know if I've told you this story or not, but uh, cleaning for family, new family in town. And they had a daughter who was 15. And at that time I was 29. So I'd been singing yeah. here for 10 years and she had all the money in the world. And um, <clears throat> I cleaned, I was cleaning her bathroom. She sat on our bed and practiced guitar practice a song she wrote. And as she played that song, I knew where she was going and where I was not. She's 15, all the money in the world <clears throat> and writing that, you know, and I said, did you write that song? She's like, yeah, it's going to be in my first album. And the song was teardrop of my guitar. And the girl was well, Taylor Swift. Yeah. And so that was the evening where I packed my cleaning supplies in my truck And I drove home brokenhearted, knowing that I had to pivot and I had to do something different. But I didn't know what that was. All I felt was a loser then. So sometimes there's not just an opportunity that bounces out at you. You have to really regroup. And what I did was instead of feeling like a loser, I started regrouping and changing my attitude. And I started reading books about how to better myself and the Bible and business books. And the attitude of why am I just going to be a house cleaner turned into, well, why not just be a house cleaner? I'm going to be the best cleaner in Nashville. So I decided to expand my cleaning business and I hired people to help me. And and that was a really good business for me. And then I was finally stable, paid off my bills, had great credit, had a little bit of savings, bought a house. And I was open to what God wanted me to do. If Okay, Lord, if there's something else you want me to do, great. If there's not, okay, I'm, I'm content. And then I was cleaning a client's bathroom. I guess I have all my epiphanies in bathrooms near a toilet. And Most people do, though. <laughs> Mine are in the shower. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And my brother called. He stood in line at a cupcake shop in New York City for two hours. And while eating a red velvet cupcake in New York City in Central Park, he's like, you should open a cupcake shop in Nashville. I was like, what? What? What the heck? What? No, no. And then I thought, why not? Why not me? And that is where I decided to pivot and go, okay. You know, I've failed before. If I fail, I fail. I'm going to do it. So that was the day. It was September 2007 where I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And the rest is history. (laughs) But you opened yourself up to that at least. Right. Which most people don't don't even get to that point. Most people can't fight the fear enough and, and, and get over that fear. And it's crippling. So they just stay stuck because they can't go past that fear of why not instead of what if, what if, what if I don't ever want to know what if I want to go, why not? I'm the why not person. Nice. (laughs) I was telling you about this earlier. A lot of times, and this came to me later in life, you know, when I get that fear that's coming in, usually when it's kind of like right before something that could be a big opportunity, I realize, Oh, you know what? Fear is here. Like that means that something really big is around the corner. Right. I should do this. Yes. And that's our sign. Fear should be a sign for like, well, you know what? Let's go for this. Because usually fear comes with doubt and it comes from the devil. So that's if right. you think about, okay, I'm fearing, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Well, being afraid does not come from God. Because he says in the Bible, I don't know how many, 90,000 times, yeah. fear not, fear not. He says that more than anything. Right. And so if he's saying and telling us to fear not, why are we fearing? Because if God's got our back, why, hello? 
Yeah. You don't need anything else. Yeah. <laughs> You've got everything you need. That's it, right. It's pretty empowering. Right. It is. You started Gigi's Cupcakes mm-hmm. out of or com- coming out of your cleaning business. Right. Well, I still have my cleaning business until I had 13 stores open. <laughs> Because I was afraid to let go of my baby business. Wow. So let me, want me to tell you what happened? Oh, please. So I went to four banks. They, I'm like, oh, well, I've got great credit. You know, I've got a little bit of savings. I've been in business like 17 years at that time. And they all laughed in my face, four banks. And I was like, what? They're like, you're not, cupcakes? I'm not giving you money for cupcakes. A cupcake shop? Are you out of your mind? I'm like, I don't think so. But I get it. And so I went ahead and I took out a hundred thousand dollars cash advances on my credit cards and I win it. Talk about fear. Yeah. That was fear that I've never experienced in my life. So the night before, <laughs> yeah. you, you're even feeling uncomfortable in your seat right now. Well, you know, Dave Ramsey is just right down the road oh, from I here. He, I definitely didn't do it the Dave Ramsey way. That's why he's never had me on his show. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, but we all have different routes, right? That's right. There's different ways to success and different paths. Absolutely. There's not just a set path on how to make it or how to be a better person. You have to find your path. So <clears throat> took out $100,000 cash advances. And the day before I opened my first store, downtown Nashville, I had $33 left to my name. I had one uh, guy come in for the plumbing, the plumber guy. I cleaned two houses to pay the plumber. And I looked and I said, don't cash that check yet. Cause I don't have the money in there yet. I, after that, I'd have $33 left to my name and a hundred thousand dollars in debt on my credit cards and still my small little cleaning business, but that hundred thousand dollars. So I went ahead and went to sleep that night and I, in a fetal position, crying, going, God, what have I done with myself? And <clears throat> woke up the next morning, knew not what I was doing, <laughs> put on my little apron and said, God, here we go. And lines formed and that $33 turned in in five years to 120 stores in 24 states with $33. Wow. Yeah. Going back in time, thinking about this timeline here, you started in 2007 to oh, 2008. February 21st, 2008, I opened my doors. Yeah. 13 and, years ago. And that was right at the start of the, of the recession. Oh, yeah. That was the, the day, I think, that uh, the, cra- the crash. I'm like, I'm just going to open this business. What the? So I'm used to starting in either pandemics or recessions. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I like to feel the heat, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, here we are. <laughs> well, just let me know when you want to start a new business, and then we'll all know to prepare for, yeah, for something <laughs> really big happening. Oh, goodness. Uh, well, I I don't know. I guess that I just have always thought if it's the right timing, it may not be the right timing for everyone or for the world or whatever, but if God is saying do it, you have to do it. Yeah. Even if you fail, you still will learn something out of that. Everything that God tells you to do, you're not going to be rained down with golden coins. Sometimes you're doing it for the lesson or to get you somewhere else where you need to be. Right. I think every time, no matter what, you'll get stronger through that experience. Right. Right. And I'm not saying don't take wise counsel or don't get a great lawyer to help you with a business plan or don't listen to people. I'm not, I'm not saying be careless. I'm just saying that if something is just eating at you in your gut and in your in your psyche of, God, I've got to do this, but you're too afraid to do it, you're not doing yourself justice and you're not doing the world justice because you are supposed to get out there and create something and make the world a better place. That's okay, right. welcome. We're open. <laughs> Come on in. Oh, yeah. No, we're fine. We've got, we're open. See, we're just doing a live podcast. Yeah. How do you feel about this, Bat? No, this is fun. <laughs> well, and and it's fun seeing the people coming in, and it's mm-hmm. fun hearing people talking uh, that that have been here before and say, oh, I know exactly what I want. This is so good. Right, I mean, right. So, so, then, so you, you have a really good, loyal customer base. Well, I'm building it. It's taken a yeah. while because we were in a pandemic, <laughs> and it's the worst time to ever start a business. And I still lay in bed and go, what was I thinking? All my savings are gone. Everything, you know, and I, it's not like not everyone, everyone in the world's feeling this. So I'm not the only one. Right. But I just felt like the need to start Pies by Gigi 
And I started it in the pandemic. So I called Meals by Gigi, first of all. So I started delivering meals to uh, people that could, were shut in that we couldn't get out. So I, I like, hey, let me put a website together. I'm going to start doing Meals by Gigi yep. and start uh, shuffling meals out and delivering all across Nashville. Yeah, there, there was an opportunity right there, right. a really right. immediate opportunity. Right. I want to go back to talking about Gigi's Cupcakes, mm -hmm. but then also you were still doing your cleaning business at the same time. Right. And it sounds like you had some really uh, either high profile or successful clients I did. in your cleaning business. I did. I had a lot of high profile people. Were you able to learn anything from them that helped you with Gigi's Cupcakes? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, when you're working for top people in the music industry, you know, Leanne Rimes, Taylor Swift, all of the management companies that manage these huge, not all, but I mean, I managed uh, clean for vector entertainment and a lot of people business people doctors lawyers and i may not have gone to business school but when i'm sitting there dusting a, di a guy's desk and he's one of the biggest traders in the world and he does it out of his home office and he's like come here Gigi, this is why i'm selling this stock today and why you should buy this and why you should i may not be in a business class but while i'm dusting that guy's desk i'm learning and so yeah. all of my amazing customers were like, you need a marketing plan. I'm like, well, I've got $33. I don't have a marketing plan. They're like, no, you have to have a marketing plan. I'm like, uh, I know in theory I do, but I have $33 left to my name. And they're like, how are you going to open this cupcake shop? I'm like, I'm just going to open my doors. And they're like, you're crazy. I'm like, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. So I, I learned valuable lessons from being in successful people's homes on what they do, like branding, for instance. I mean, you have to have your shtick, and that's what people yeah. say here in Nashville, right? Like every artist has their something special, something they offer, a different look, a different tone, something that makes you unique. And that's what I wanted to do with my cupcakes. I wanted them to be unique. I want them to be set apart. So the high frosting, naming each one of them, Scarlet's Red Velvet yep. or Hunk of Chunk of Banana Love or Wedding Cake. So people subliminally remembered those names and remembered what they looked like. And that was a part of my big success. And to your point, you know, the, uh, the large amount of icing on top, right. like the high icing, right. like that helped them stand out visually. It did. Like if you stood them alongside other bakeries cupcakes, like you would know exactly which one was a Gigi's cupcake. Right. Because of the swirl and the way that we would do it. And most women, 96% of all women, we did a study on it, love frosting, right? And I'm one of those people. So I would go to a wedding or a birthday. I'm like, oh, I want the corner piece with the rose on yeah. it. Give me more frosting, more <laughs> <Yeah>. frosting. <laughs> so if I like more frosting, and then we did this analytic analytical data on 96% of all women love frosting. Well, if 95% are all in my client base uh, and I love frosting, I need the cake to ratio of frosting. Yeah. And people would come in and said, you need too much frosting. I'm like, scrape it off. Yeah. You don't have to eat it. I'm not, I'm not making you eat all the frosting. If you don't like frosting, scrape it off. But for the people that like that frosting, there's enough for the last bite. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't like the frosting, you're probably not that ideal customer. Well, or uh, that's fine. I mean, you can, there's a few cupcakes that we have that don't have the huge frosting. Yeah. Or scrape it off. Yeah. <laughs> or give it to you, the person next to you that loves the frosting. <laughs> that wants even more frosting. Frosting, right. Beyond just the, the design of the cupcake and beyond just the uniqueness of the frosting, you created a system and an experience right. for Gigi's Cupcakes. Right. Why was it important to define the overall Gigi's Cupcakes experience as the franchise grew? Well, uh, people love consistency. And you have to, when you go to Chick-fil-A, you want, if you're, whether you're in Utah or Vegas, you want the same type of consistency with the franchise concept. So if I was going to con franchise my concept, I had to be consistent across the country. And I was a stickler for what it looked like, what they tasted like, and I was not going to sacrifice the look, the taste, the texture, 
or customer service. Now, did we fall short on some stores? Of course we did. I mean, but that was what I wanted to make sure that every time you walked into a Gigi's Cupcakes, they'd go, oh, this is Gigi's Cupcakes. I'll take that wedding cake or I'll take that Scarlet's Red Velvet. And they knew they were going to get the same consistent product. So if you're building a brand and you're growing a brand, consistency is absolutely the key. It absolutely is. But now if you've got different business owners who who own their own franchise location, right. I can imagine that they've likely got their ideas of what they think their customers want. So how do you ensure that it remains consistent even when you've got these other people that have their own ideas? <laughs> the chi- I call them the chickens. The chickens. Herding chickens, herding yeah. cats. Uh, well, it's very difficult. That's why franchising isn't for the faint of heart <laughs> and it's it's so important to be a stickler for the, the what what you what your brand is supposed to be and if they're supposed to franchise and they're good franchisees all they should do is execute the concept that you've come up with that you've already made a success so and they just replicate that in their city and most most franchisees we had did that and they did a wonderful job at it Oh, good! because they, if they're a franchisee, they're like, Oh, I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. I don't want to make it Maryland's cupcakes or Beth's cupcakes. I'm buying into Gigi's cupcakes. So I want to do be the success that she has been. So I'll just execute the concept. And a lot of most, most people get that if they're buying into a franchise, there's a few that didn't that we had some, um, butting of heads with, and it's been it, that was very difficult. It was very difficult uh, building a franchise company because we are the largest franchise uh, cupcake f- franchise in the world, and yeah. we pioneered the cupcake franchise concept. And pioneering is extremely difficult, but we did it, and I'm proud of what we built. And to your point, you know, like you you knew what worked right? and it's up to the franchisees to be able to say, okay, like this is what already works. Right. This is what is in my control that I can take on and and, and that I can do to help amplify the business in this market. Correct. Like if people like the cookies more and they say, well, we have a real cookie market here. Okay. Well, here's a recipe for our cookies and go for it. So we had to also evolve as well as a, as a franchise company. Right. You know, we, we, we learned so much from our franchisees so much. They had great ideas and that's what makes a great franchise company is you listen to your franchisees because we're partners they're not our workers. We're partners in yeah. this, right? And so we, and they're our customer. So we want to make them happy. And we tried the best we could. Sometimes we failed. I mean, you're not always spot on. You're just not because everyone's human. Right. But we did try to listen. And our franchisees, since we were so new and we were pioneering the concept, and I'd never done a franchise company before, um, they taught us we grew together. And it was a, it was a wonderful blessing. Oh, very it's cool. A, amazing experience. And I love how you talked about your franchisees being your customer too. Right. Because I don't think enough business owners, I don't think enough business leaders understand who all of their customers are. Right. Of course, right. you've got the customer that walks in the door right. wanting to buy the cupcakes, right. but then everybody else, you know, your vendors and your suppliers, right. your franchisees, your employees are your customer. Right, right. I think the experience we provide our employees is just as important as the experience that we provide our customers. So tell me your approach to the experience you provide to your employees and how do you lead your employees? Well, that was through trial and error, of course, but passion is the number one thing. You can't really? passion, passion. If you, if someone has passion and work ethic, you can teach them anything. But if they don't have passion or work ethic, you can't really teach them. Even if they have all the credentials on the wall in the world, right? True. And, oh, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. But you come in here and you're a bad employee because you don't sell, you're not passionate, and you don't have a good work ethic. I don't need you. I need passion. And so if I'm the one that has this ball of passion and I can give that to people, 
and say, I love my pies because, or I love my cupcakes and you're going to love them too. And here's why. And I can spread that passion. That's the key. So that's how I built a brand through passion and work ethic. There's a lot of people that do it differently, but that's how I did it because that's me in a nutshell, working hard and passion. Well, yeah, I'm a little ball of passion and fire. That's for sure. And so I taught that through teaching people how to do it. And there, and then there's that balance, right? Not micromanaging, letting go to grow. So there's all of that that I had to learn and showing people the passion, showing them how to do it, you know, teaching a man to fish and not giving them just a fish. You know, that's the, the whole concept of it, right? Right. You teach them how to do it. If they have the work ethic and the passion behind it and they get your brand, they will be the next people. And developing this circle of passionate, cool people that you love working with, like a family atmosphere, and it just spreads out. I don't think enough leaders understand that your people are going to model what they see from you. Right. Whatever you... Um, what, whatever you exert, yeah. it's contagious. It is contagious. So if yeah. you're stressed out, if you're acting stressed, right. your people are going to be stressed. That's right. But That's right. if you're showing passion, then your people are going to show passion right. too, right. hopefully. Passion and energy. And with this, you know, with everything, I didn't show it every day. I was scared. I was worried. I was freaking out. I was figuring out what I was doing. But now looking back, even when I'm afraid or even when I've had a bad day or I can't pay a bill, when I walk into this place, I put my game face on and I try to be the best leader I can be. And I try to be like, okay, everyone, we've got this. This is a mountain, but we can do it. Come on, everyone. Let's get going. So you have to, you have to model what you want people to do, basically. I mean, it's yeah. simple, but <laughs> we forget it sometimes. We, we absolutely do. Yeah. We, we, um, I think too many people focus on themselves and forget that you've got all of your people mm -hmm. that you need to make sure that they're uh, modeling what you're putting out. Right. And people don't want to be micromanaged. So oh, no. most people, if, you, if you're going to grow, you can't micromanage. And people don't like it. But then how do you balance passion with not micromanaging, with letting them do their thing? It's a, I'm not saying it's easy. I, no. it is very hard. But the two books that I learned from so much is The E Myth Theory by Michael Gerber. Oh, yes. Ever, oh. The E Myth Revisited? Revisited, yeah. yes. The E Myth Theory Revisited, yeah. And by Michael Gerber, the one of the best books I've ever read in my entire life. That and The One Minute Manager and yes. The Noticer. Did you ever read The Noticer? The Noticer. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not right. familiar with that. Andy. Shoot, Andy something. And it's just the way he noticed people and acknowledged people's feelings in the book. It's not even well, a yeah. business book. It's just a life book. Right. But I learned so much from, okay, let me acknowledge these people's feelings. Let me acknowledge how they feel. But let's go ahead and reroute this and let's let's get productive without making people feel bad. Right. Yeah. You have to motivate people without making them feel bad. And that's still an art. I'm not saying I've mastered it. I'm not saying I do it perfect, but I really do try. And so that is showing your passion and building a brand. That sounds like showing empathy. Right. Empathy right. for your people as well. But you can't get bogged down on the empathy because you got to be like, okay, we need to motivate peeps. Let's go. All right. Get out of your trench. Get out of the <clears throat> trench. Come on. Come on. Let's work. Let's do this. So what's that balance? Yeah. And we all forget that the best business book in the world is the Bible. Hello. Yeah, yeah. It's called Proverbs and Psalms. Have you read that lately? Talk about chocked full of wisdom book is Proverbs. Absolutely. If you want to be a better business person, read Proverbs every day. And I promise you, you will be the best business person in the world. Because if you follow what the Bible says, it is the best business book that's ever been written. It really is. <laughs> we, hello. Well, I mean, they wrote it for a reason. Yeah. And, 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 and there's so many great lessons on what to do when you're leading people and what, what not, not to, to do. do. Right. <laughs> so now, now you, you've, you've moved on from Gigi's Cupcakes yes, and you I opened did. Pies by Gigi. Yes. What led you to open Pies by Gigi and how is it different from Gigi's Cupcakes? Well... 
it, I decided to close my, I sold the company five years ago and I was a franchisee after that with my one store and it just wasn't working out with being the face of the brand and the founder and then just going to being a franchisee. It, no, it just wasn't, it was, it was time to close that door as painful as that was. That was the hardest thing I've ever done is close the door on my baby business. Yeah. And it was heartbreaking. And then a month later, the pandemic hit. So I'm left with who am I? No job, no identity. What the heck am I going to do? I still have a child to raise by myself. You know, like, what am I going to do? I have to provide. Yeah. And then I thought, well, why not start doing meals for people in need that can't get out. And so I, I started meals by Gigi and pies by Gigi. And we, I started delivering meals all across Nashville just to, first of all, uh, survive, make money that I needed to provide for my daughter right? and building a brand. And, and what I've found, I'm on the cusp of what do people want? They want comfort food right now. That's the new trend, comfort Comfort, oh, yeah. and that's what I can give people. I give that better than anything. So I'm like, okay, what do people want? They want chicken pot pie. They want shepherd's mm. pie. They want, and so, so I was like, pies by Gigi. I've always wanted to do a pie store. It's been my first love. No, not a lot of people know that. And so when brick and mortar came to be out, I took the leap in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so we've been open for four months, and it's been extremely hard. And I'm about ready to pivot again. So this week I'm going to pivot into Gigi's Kitchen. <gasps> wow. And Gigi's Kitchen. And so we're changing our name to Gigi's Kitchen. We're still going to do bakery, cafe. But what I found through being open in this last four months was people want to come in and have more than just pies. They come in, they're like, oh, I didn't know you did more than pies. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> no one knows this because I named it Pies by Gigi. But we're still going to do pies, but we do so much more. We have kale salads and paninis and, and tons of shepherd's pies, chicken pot pies, low-fat chicken enchiladas, meatloaf, chili, yeah. lasagna. So we're meeting the needs of what our customer base has told us. So come in here. I've got a beautiful space. I could... Uh, private parties, wedding showers, birthday parties, weddings. I'm doing a small wedding in here. Really? So I'm renting, oh, wow. I rent out my space and do the food. We're doing lots of catering. So I'm just pivoting. And that's what people want. People want meals. Yeah. And they want to come in. And I'm doing a writer's night every Tuesday night. We do writer's nights. And, the songwriter's mm -hmm, night? Songwriter's How night. How fun. And people can come in and listen to the songwriters and have dinner and have a dessert and sit and hang. And people can feel safe because it's not real crowded. There's just, right. we seat about 35 people and it's wonderful. So we're in Brentwood and Gigi's Kitchen is uh, happening. And here we are. <laughs> and I love the name because I love how, how that ties back to the Gigi's Cupcakes right. name. There's that sense of having a brand name that ties back to what people really know you from right. or, or from, from, from earlier in your career. Right. That's right. And people want to know that. And m most people, they weren't going to trust someone that baked out. I know I had a commercial kitchen that I baked out of, but they knew me through cupcakes. So they're like, Oh, she's doing pies now and casseroles. Oh, yep. so there, there was a trust there. Right. And so now that Gigi's kitchen is coming and that's Southern and it sounds homey and it, it's really what I do. I bake and cook and I provide meals of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So come in and I'm here all the time. <laughs> I'm here baking up some goodness. One of the things that you've been talking about recently, beyond just Pies by Gigi or Gigi's Kitchen, mm -hmm. you've been pushing a significant advocacy for small business owners. Yes. And I have. on one side, you know, we, we we all need to be encouraging people to support their local small business owner. Right. Absolutely. Because right. they're hurt more so than so many others it, in this yes. time. They are the ones that have suffered. And it is uh, the only ones that haven't are big box stores yeah. and big tech. 
Yeah. And and I don't know if that's a plan or not, but it seems a little interesting to me. So we need to evolve and grow, of course. But we have to remember your neighbor has a pie store or has a bakery or has a pharmacy. Yeah. Go and support them because they're their neighbors. They're the people that need it the most. Absolutely. And so I really talk about small business and what small business can offer that a big box or big tech or a big huge company can never do is experience through love. I mean, you can't, they can't replicate that, that you get that passion and that experience when you come into a small business. Oh yeah. And, and they know their customers much better right. than a big box retailer will. Right. Right. On the flip side what lessons can you share with small business owners that can help them better understand how to compete with the big box stores? Well, it's very difficult to compete with big box. We all know that. Yeah. And <clears throat> but what we can do is we can evolve and we can we can offer delivery. We can offer offer uh, curbside. You can offer things that the big boxes do offer, and you could do it your way in a small, more original way. Right. And you have to pivot. If someone comes in, I was I was talking to a business guy today, and he has shake in his name. Well, people would walk in and say, "I want a shake." He's like, "Oh, I don't do shakes." And finally, his wife is like. How many people are going to walk through the door because shake is in your name Oh my goodness. and you not offer a shake? And I'm like, get back there and make a shake. Where's yeah. the ice cream people? So he started making shakes because there's shake in his name, right? Yeah. So, so listen to what your customer is wanting, which that's what I'm doing. Right. I'm listening to what my customers have wanted in the last five months. I'm pivoting myself and going, wait a minute. They want meals. They want to come in here and they want to be able to eat here or they want us to deliver meals to them. So it's all about pivoting and listening to your customer. Absolutely. If your customer is telling you what they want right. and then you provide that to them, right. then you're going to be able to keep that customer. Right. That's right. And I, it took me about four months to figure out. I sat there a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, wait a minute. People are wanting us to know. That we we. Pies by Gigi is not getting it because they don't understand that we offer full service restaurant through my name that I'm, and I'm like, we got to change it. So we're, and they're like, you don't, we don't know what you do. And I'm like, you're right. I'm going to listen to you yep. and I'm going to pivot because I want to be in this community. I want to be a part of Brentwood and yeah. Williamson County. And I want people to come and feel love and feel comfort and, you know, Minister to people here through Absolutely. food. <laughs> there you go. That's your stick. That's my stick. <laughs> All right. Last question. Okay. It's what I ask most of my guests. <laughs> if you were to create a five-song soundtrack for your business, what songs would you include? For my life. Oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. So life would be probably, um, business would be a whole different soundtrack, but it would be probably, the first one would be Don't Stop Believing." Right. If I'm a kid, nice. climb that mountain high by Reba McIntyre. And because it's all about getting out of your little small desert town and I'm oh, yeah. going to climb that mountain high. And then when I get here, uh, crazy, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy for being in Nashville. No. And then the song, uh, from Greatest Showman, never, never, never enough. And then my last song would be, you are faithful. Mm. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Because walking on faith is what he's taught me through all of this life and through all of these businesses. That if I don't have him to lean on and cling to, I have nothing. Through the ups and downs and the mountains yep. and the peaks, I have God. So God, you are faithful is my, would be my last one. <laughs> so true. So very nice. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so right. much. Well, Gigi, where can people go to learn more? <clears throat> well, on my Instagram, it's official Gigi Butler or Gigi's Kitchen and Bakery. Yeah. Or you could go on Pies by Gigi right now. You can still find us there. But you could find on all of my handles official Gigi Butler and would love to uh, be a part of people's lives. And they can walk in here and have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yum. And come in and say, is Gigi in the back? And they'll be like, yep, she's got flour all over. <laughs> Let me go get her. <laughs> 
not just a figurehead. Like you're 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 literally they here working. Literally. Well, we took pictures today, and I've got flour all over my shirt. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That that's that's evidence I'm like, right there. Dang, I've got flour on me today, and they're like, cool. eh, just go with it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Gigi, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for the awesome pie. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Gigi Butler. So go check out her book, The Secret Ingredient, Recipes for Success in Business and Life. And check out Gigi's Kitchen and Bakery in Brentwood, Tennessee. And if you're not in the Nashville area, you can order directly from her site at gigiskitchenandbakery.com. And Gigi is offering a special offer just for you. You can get 10% off your order from ggskitchenandbakery.com when you use the discount code SIMPLE10. Need a suggestion? My favorite pie is the apple crisp pie and the chicken pot pie. Okay, my favorite two pies are the apple crisp pie and the chicken pot pie and the shepherd's pie. All right, sorry. All right, my favorite three pies are the apple crisp pie, the chicken pot pie, and the shepherd's pie. And the chocolate fudge pie. All right, you know what? You pretty much just can't go wrong with anything you order from Gigi's Kitchen and Bakery. And when you enter the discount code SIMPLE10, you get 10% off of your order. That's pretty sweet. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit that subscribe button because it's going to make it a lot simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Master Mark Burns. Master Burns is the owner and master instructor of Franklin ATA Martial Arts in Franklin, Tennessee. He teaches Taekwondo and leadership lessons to kids as young as four to adults as old as, well, he doesn't really have an age limit, so if you can do the work, you're welcome to learn from him. But something that I caught a few months ago is that the lessons that Master Burns teaches can essentially be applied in your personal and professional lives. You don't literally have to do these moves, and you don't literally have to punch a wooden board in half. But you can take much of what Master Burns teaches and learn how you can thrive. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Master Burns' episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple. Simple.